Well, the, the main thing that's different about space is there's no, it's not that there's no gravity, there's always gravity, but there's no gravitational loading. If you're in a vehicle, you're orbiting a planet, or you're on your way to another planet, you're in free fall, so you're effectively weightless. And, and that has widespread impacts on the rest of the body, your bones waste, your muscles waste, your, your heart itself is a muscle pump and that does work against gravity, that also wastes. But then you see impacts in other areas that you wouldn't immediately think of, so your sense of balance and coordination are thrown off. Uh, there are now identified problems with your eyesight, uh, problems with your immune system, you, you even get a space-based anemia uh, in some astronauts. So what are some of the reasons behind those? Let's start with the balance and coordination. Why do we find a decrease in ability in that? When people first start going into space, I think they guess that they might have some problems with uh, feeling sick, um, mainly because they thought motion sickness might be an issue. But there's something more subtle than that. Uh, and, and, and it appears that, that gravity is important for our sense of spatial awareness, balance and coordination because it, it helps, it appears that it helps in some way to calibrate the systems of accelerometry that, that we have in, in, in our inner ear. Um, so so uh, you've got a system that detects rotational accelerations and a system that detects linear accelerations and it's the system, the otolith organs that detect linear acceleration that are really badly thrown off. And it's very disabling for the astronauts. When they come back to Earth, uh, they have trouble sort of doing complex, quick movements, uh, and they're not allowed to drive or fly for a good couple of days after they come back. And how long does it take for them to get back to normal? Or do they get back to normal? So it, it depends. Uh, get, getting back to normal depends on how long they've been in space. So, so for people who've been on short flights, so a few days, uh, they are usually back to normal within a day or two, um, but, but, or at least they feel reasonably normal after a day or two. Uh, for people who have been away for months and months, it's a bit different. And you know, the rule of thumb that, that people always sort of use is, is a day for every month in space. But even people who have been up for six months or more say that after a week or so being back on Earth, you feel fairly normal. And with the muscle and bone wasting, do we see any improvement in that when they come back to Earth? Quite a lot of measures are taken to uh, uh, protect bone mass and, 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 and muscle mass uh, in space and, and these include uh, a regime of, of, of resistive exercises, so, so people running on treadmills with bungee cords over their shoulders, uh, dietary supplements, etc, etc. They're not fully effective but, but they certainly do help protect. Um, when you get back, having been in negative calcium ba balance and negative nitrogen balance, so basically effectively wasting your muscle and your bone while you're in space. You go into positive balance briefly, but you don't always appear to go in positive balance for long enough. So you don't always appear to be putting the bone and muscle on, uh, back, back on quick enough to get back to zero again. So some people I think have a reduced bone mineral density for a long time after they come back. And what are some of the measurements that we can take to understand the changes that are going on. Are there measurements that are taken regularly whilst people are in space or is it just a case of uh, giving them tests before they go and once they come back? So it's, it's difficult to do tests in space uh, because you're restricted not just by weight, it costs about $22,000 to send a single kilo into low earth orbit, but you're also restricted on power because you don't have just some huge substation up there. You've got a, a finite amount of power that has to be distributed uh, over all of the systems on board the space station or the, or the vehicle that you're on. Uh, and then uh, uh, weight, power, and volume. So you know you can't have big bulky items. So they do do measurements up there, but they tend to choose measurements that can be made easily, non-invasively, uh, and with compact devices. Uh, when they come back, they get a much more comprehensive uh, set of tests. Do you think perhaps we might be seeing an underreporting of perhaps incidents in astronauts who don't want to report that they've been sick in case they aren't allowed to go back up again? So it's, it's difficult because these people wait a long time before they're allowed to fly and, and are probably very conscious of the fact that 
if they have a medical event in space uh, that, that, that it, you know, it may interfere with their chances of flying again. So I think there may be a tendency to underreport. Whether or not there's any evidence that that's the case is, is another thing. But you know, I, I think that if you ask anyone if they were in that situation, you, know, you, 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 you probably wouldn't want to take the chance that's going to stop you from flying again. If the, the lack of the sort of gravity that we're used to on Earth is one of the main problems, is there a way that we, you know, in sci-fi you often see people walking around on spaceships with artificial gravity. Is that something that could be produced realistically? So I mean, there's a few things to say about artificial gravity. First of all, it's a bit of a misnamer because it's not artificial. Uh, it, it is gravity. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the Einstein equivalence principle, which, which says that all acceleration is you know, equivalent. And so, so uh, if, whether it's the accelerations by virtue of rotation or inertial mass, etc., etc., etc. So artificial gravity does provide you a potential way of doing it. And it's not impossible to do. You need to be able to rotate a vehicle. You know, the, the, the trick that you're pulling off with artificial gravity is just the same one as you pull off at a party. If you fill a bucket with water, you tie a rope to the handle, you swing it around your head and the water doesn't come out. It's as simple as that. Um, the problem is, is that makes your engineering much more complicated because you have to build larger vehicles and possibly slightly heavier vehicles. They have studied this quite extensively uh, and they've now decided that the vehicles wouldn't be prohibitively expensive but they may be very very much more complicated and the one thing you don't want to have when you go into space is a vehicle that's more complicated than it needs to be. And what challenges do these medical issues potentially pose for further space exploration, for example going to Mars? I think the future exploration of Mars is going to be like the history of exploration elsewhere. It goes through a period of being extremely dangerous and extremely expensive and, 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 and hopefully later it at least becomes less expensive. It may, it may remain dangerous. You know, going to Antarctica is still dangerous today, uh, but it's not as expensive because we've managed to get, get you know, commercial airlines and commercial ship lines to assist the logistics there. You know, that we have commercial manufacturers who make clothes that protect those explorers at, 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 a, at a price that you can basically afford yourself as a private citizen. Uh, and, and so, that's where you hope that space flight goes in the future, that, that, that we can continue to continue to explore because actually either it gets safer and, and it gets cheaper, or at least it gets cheaper.